Louisiana Legends is made possible by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Louisiana. This important program series enables us to discover, through the accomplishments of our fellow Louisianians, the unique character of a state so proudly served by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Louisiana for 60 years. City, and I'm with Tony Kushner, who is perhaps uh, our best young playwright. He may be affronted by that word young, but when you get to my age, Tony, everybody looks young. It's a pleasure to see you. Tony hails from uh, Lake Charles, That's right. goes home frequently, mother deceased, dad the conductor of the Lake Charles Symphony. That's right. Tony, You've won every prize that the theater can give, uh, the Pulitzer, the Tony Awards, just everything, the drama critics. Much of it for this play, which I'm holding, Angels in America, now that the passion and the fury of writing it are over and the accolades have come your way, how do you feel when you look at this, when you look back at this? Oh, God, I'm... Uh... I feel um, proud about the way that it went, and um, a lot of it is a very pleasant memory. Um, a lot of it was really overwhelming at the time, and I sort of went through it in a bit of a daze, I'm now beginning to realize. Um, but I took a lot of notes, so I'll be able someday when I'm interested enough to go back and remember exactly what it was like. Um, it was a really exciting time, and I'm really glad at the moment that it's... Um, quieting down a bit because it was also very, very distracting and in its own way uh, really intimidating. And it's, it's, um, it's beginning to feel as of about this summer, I think, that I um, have enough distance from it so that I don't have to feel um, afraid of writing anymore because for about two or three years I think the, the feeling that I would never be able to equal what I did with Angels and that nothing that I wrote would ever have the kind of acclaim that Angels had has sort of worn off. I mean, I, it may be the case that I'll never do anything um, that good again and it may be the case that nobody will like anything that I do again, I don't know. But I've at least to this point gotten sort of bored with being worried about that and, and so it's freed up um, writing for me. Where did this, uh, uh, or what, what's the origin of your desire to write? That fascinates me always. Where, where does that spring from? Um, well, I mean, I think I, um, it's it's nothing particularly mysterious. I think that um, in part it kind of comes. From, I come from a very artistic family. My father is a musician. My mother was a musician. My brother is a first one of the Vienna Symphoniker, and my sister is a painter. That's one of her paintings there. Um, sh and, uh, you know, we, we were encouraged to um, uh, enjoy the arts and to, to participate fully in the arts when we were kids. Um, I think that my father has a great love of literature that... Um, he was very careful to make sure that all of his children inherited, and we all did. We're all big readers. And I think that's a big part of wanting to be a writer. I think anybody who really loves books and really loves to read at some point thinks about writing. Um, and um, my mother was, in addition to being a really great bassoonist, a, a really fine actress, an amateur actress, um, when uh, she had the time from her uh, with her playing in the various symphony orchestras that she played in. She did um, uh, acting with the Lake Charles Little Theater and uh, Acts, which is another little theater in Lake Charles, and, um, and was really great. And that had a huge impact on me when I was a kid. I think that that sort of pushed me towards the theater. So I think I sort of grew up in, in the right kind of atmosphere for a writer to grow. Did you also in. have great love for classical music, which must have been so present in your home? Uh, I, 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 yes and no. I mean, I, uh, I think that a lot of my adolescent rebellion 
um, which was, you know, fairly ordinary as far as adolescent rebellion goes, but I had it, uh, took the form of, of kind of rejecting classical music. I mean, I didn't grow up playing an instrument, which I really regret. Um, but as I've gotten older, I've now um, gotten much uh, more familiar with uh, the classics. Having um, a brother and a father who are constantly performing them helps because every time I'm told that they're doing a piece, I go out and get it and listen to it. And uh, I've become recently very interested in opera. I'm actually writing a couple of opera librettos for a uh, few for um, Bobby McFerrin and San Francisco Opera. And, Tony, uh, how did you uh, decide to come to New York originally? Um, well, I was born here. Yes. We, I moved down to Lake Charles when I was two. Two um, years I, old. Right? I had um, always had a big family up here, my mother's family, and I was very close to them. And uh, I wanted to go to college here, I think, because I was interested in theater. Um, I think also probably in part because, um, uh, uh, well, being gay, it was essential that I get out of a town the size of Lake Charles where... Um, there wasn't any uh, visible gay culture when I was growing up, and I th think even before I knew that that's what I wanted, some part of me had decided that I needed to go and find um, a place where I could be with other people like me. And um, uh, I wanted to be in um, the greatest city in the world, which I believe New York was at the time, and I guess I still sort of believe that. Um, so I. You went to Columbia? I went to Columbia College. And studied? I st well, I majored in medieval literature at first um, and stayed as a medieval studies major until uh, the end of my junior year. And then in my senior year, switched to a sort of more general English literature degree. Because what could one do with that medieval study well, that was except the teach, I that guess? That was the question, yeah. yeah. I went to a medieval studies conference in my junior year and saw these people who had spent their lives kind of trying to figure out, you know, the meaning of one particular passage in a text that had been written 800 years before, and I thought this is not really um, uh, an exciting enough uh, or relevant enough life in a certain way. I mean, I have great respect for medieval scholars, but it didn't seem really like what I wanted to do with my time. Um, I, I'm glad I did it. I got a lot of really uh, great information um, that I've drawn on since. So you graduate. Uh-huh. And uh, when do you, or, or were you already writing? I did. A, uh, I wrote a little bit in Columbia, but not much. I, I, I knew that I wanted to write, but I was afraid to. I figured that I probably wouldn't be very good at it, and I didn't want. I mean, my parents were very encouraging about being about all of their children becoming artists, but they were also fairly clear that uh, it was a serious profession, and you should do it if you can make a living at it. I mean, they gave us both an, uh, examples of, of people of grown-ups who were artists, but also grown-ups who had made their living as artists. And, and so I think for all three of us, it really was clear that if we were going to go into the arts, it should be as serious professionals. And um, so uh, I was afraid. I mean, that puts a certain burden on, on the work. And uh, after I graduated, before I left Columbia, I started directing in the student uh, theater there. And I, and I realized that I had a certain ability um, I don't think I'm a tremendously good director, but I'm a pretty good director. And I, I liked it well enough. And I think that was sort of a backdoor into writing. I went to NYU a couple of years after I graduated from Columbia and uh, got a master's degree in directing from the theater program at NYU. And while I was at NYU, started writing seriously. How did you make a living? This uh, is a tough town to be young, a student. Well, broke. it's tougher now than it used to be. You could really live for very little money. I had help from my parents. Um, when I was at Columbia, but I always worked. I worked at a liquor store. Um, I was a stock boy at a liquor store for most of the time that I was at Columbia. And then when I graduated, I was a switchboard operator at the UN Plaza Hotel and also at NYU Medical Center. I, I learned how to use, uh, how to be a telephone operator. And, and you could make fairly good money. And so I supported myself that way. Uh, and I worked through graduate school as a switchboard operator. Tony, if, if someone asked me what would be the very toughest occupation uh, uh, that one could choose on earth? I would, I would name two. People who work on tar roofs in the south in the summer, that would be one. 
And playwrights who write serious drama <laughs> would be a close second. I must put the construction workers first with our heat in, in the well, side. I actually have to say, tell you, I, I, I did both of those jobs. Yes, and which was, was the toughest? Um, you know, I enjoyed the first uh, being a. I didn't actually. I didn't tar roofs, but I, I, I loaded shingles onto roofs for my father. My father owns a lumber company in Lake Charles, and in my 18th year, uh, after I finished high school, I spent a summer throwing roofing shingles up on roofs. It was really, really hard work, but um, I actually sort of enjoyed it. I mean, I remember enjoying it now. I'm and, glad I don't have to do it for my entire and life. And writing a serious play. See, uh, uh, I want to share with. Uh, our audience across Louisiana, and you break in and correct me if I'm wrong, there is very little serious theater being done in any place. Uh, I read an article uh, uh, in a local paper here today in New York where Arthur Miller says it, it's virtually impossible. Yet you are a serious playwright. That is somebody who writes on the, on the most important themes uh, uh, that consume a lifetime, our lifetime and do it successfully. So there's something miraculous about what you have achieved. Well, I don't know. I, mean, I wouldn't go that far. I mean, I think that I think there's um, uh, still an appetite for serious drama. I think that um, the sort of trick of being um, um, uh, a serious playwright with aspirations for a certain degree of uh, popular, and I'm not ashamed to say it, commercial success, um, which, after all, Arthur Miller had, and Tennessee Williams had, and O'Neill had. I mean, these were all people who made their livings as playwrights and made their livings in the commercial theater as playwrights. And I think that there's a there's a um, an incredible need for government support for the arts. And I think that there the drama in in um, the United States has grown as government and corporate support for the arts has grown and will begin to die out if this support dies out, as it seems to be doing right now. Um, and I think that's a very bad thing. But I also think it's a good, uh, it's a worthy aspiration to say, I want to write something that's serious um, and that demands a certain amount of serious attention from an audience and yet is entertaining enough to sell a lot of tickets. That's the um, trick. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's what one struggles with. I mean, I, I, I've written plays that I think, you know, I'm glad I don't have to count on them uh, to m pay the rent. Um, and it's always a balancing act. You write um, a difficult play that's, you know, the play that I wrote right after Angels uh, called Slobs, um, uh, which was done in Houston at the Alley Theater, and it's been done all over the world now. And I'm, I consider it a completely successful play, and it's, it's been recognized as a successful play. But it's about a subject that I think, um, at this particular moment in history, which, uh, socialism, that people aren't really interested in addressing. Uh, and I never had any expectations that Slavs would wind up on Broadway. I'm writing a, a couple of plays now, uh, one of which I know will be like Slavs for a smaller audience, and one of which I have hopes will, if not make it to Broadway, then at least become um, a standard Let fare. Let me ask you this. Does it put uh, uh, any additional burden on you? Because you, unlike most playwrights, know that when you finish the work, and it has Tony Kush's name on it, somebody is going to do it. Yeah. Does that put a, a, a more burden on you? In other words, many people write and say, you know, I'll put this in a, in, in a closet or in a chest, or I'll show it to my wife or husband, and uh, that removes a lot of pressure because many plays die uh, like those flowers born to blush unseen. But when you write something, your name's on it, it's going to be seen, and, and does that put burden on you? Oh sure. I mean, it's uh, you know. I mean, it's also a real privilege. It's it's an incredible luxury. Um, I mean, in a funny way, part of the burden it puts on you is that you have to be sure that it's being shown because it's good and not being shown just because your name's on it. Um, I mean, I always have the option of not showing it to anybody or refusing to let it be performed if it doesn't live up to my standards. I write pretty slowly and carefully. So, so far I haven't come up with anything since Angels that I feel I don't want people to see. There's what, always... What, what are your work habits? How, how, how bad. Do you, bad? Good. What, uh, do you write in the mornings, at night, what, when, when, whenever? I mean, I'm trying right now to sort of discipline myself into a kind of morning work routine because they really are appallingly bad. I mean, they're just, you know, whenever I uh, run out of excuses and 
am trapped by deadlines and have no choice other than to sit down and write. And that's, um, that's really hard. It, there's a stress that it puts on you, you know, 24 hours a day if you're running away from your work. Uh, and I think it can shorten your life substantially. So I, I really want to um, try and get myself more disciplined um, about when I write. Um, the ideal thing would be to write four or five hours in the morning, and then you're really done for the day. I mean, that's another way in which it's easier to be a playwright than a roofing are you, person. Uh, are you afraid of what I call the, uh, it's not peculiar to me, the Tennessee Williams phenomenon? That is, whom the gods created, they then destroyed. For example, for a time when he wrote a play, it was just one glorious piece of literature after another. And then the critics knocked down Everything he committed to paper, there was almost a destructive bent. Uh, uh, uh. He became, uh, uh, where he had been an idol, he became a target. Does that frighten you at all? Well, yeah, sure. I mean, um, it's terrifying. I, I have to say that when I look back over the careers of, of most Amer of the major American playwrights, um, it's not the case that any of them were... I mean, when you look at, like, Tennessee's career, I mean, for one thing, the man drank and took a lot of drugs, and that's not a great idea for anybody. It's going to take a toll eventually, and it took a toll on him. Um, and uh, there was a kind of a weird um, dialectic going on between the critics and Tennessee. He would write something uh, that wasn't as great as Streetcar. Some of them would love it. I mean, a lot of his plays that are lesser plays, but good plays, like the three or four after Streetcar, did reasonably well. Um, then he sort of went into a slide and they started attacking, but he did actually go into a slide. I mean, the, yeah, the, he wrote every day. Oh, he wrote every day. I mean, he was incredibly heroic in that regard. It was apparently a rather mean man, but he wrote every single day, and he was impressive in that way. And I think he is our greatest, either him or O'Neill, I don't know which, but I mean, he, I, I really love his plays and they've had a huge impact on me. I just... Um, it's not the case that a lot of those late Tennessee Williams plays are, are diamonds waiting to be rediscovered. Most of them are pretty bad, and, and it would have been um, an over-generous critic that would have said, you know, this is wonderful, go see it. Um, by the time he died, I mean, there was a recent revival of Red Devil Battery Sign, which is one of his last, and it shouldn't have been revived. It's really unwatchable. And nobody's doing him any favors by dragging that stuff out. And I've read a number of the later plays. And so have I. I, I, don't, I don't think it was there anymore. Are you uh, able to look at your own work, I hate to use the word coldly, uh, uh, at some distance? Are you able to, to assess your work and, and, and have feelings about it? This I succeeded, here I... Yeah, I, yeah, think, I think reasonably. I mean, one of the great things about being a playwright as opposed to a novelist or a poet is that you have an audience to tell you. And, I, and one thing I know that I'm good at is, is reading an audience. I don't kid myself about what an audience that's having a good time sounds like or what an audience that's having a bad time sounds like. And I really want the audiences in my place to be having a good time. I'm not an, uh, I'm, and I have respect for some artists who deliberately set out to frustrate and infuriate and, and frighten their audiences away. I think that can be an interesting exercise. It's just not what I'm interested in. Does the communal... Uh, uh, activity that surrounds the writing and producing, specifically the producing of a play. Does that disturb you? Here's what I mean. Uh, you may spend a year writing a play, and now a producer comes along, and he's going to get some money up to put on that play. Then a director comes along, and he brings a whole other experiences. And suddenly you're being bombarded by all of these. Even the Janet in the theater tells you that he doesn't like uh, when the character comes in with the bottle. Is that a satisfactory thing that communal? For ex a novel, as you know, is you and an editor. Poetry is you and an editor. But a, a, a play is a whole bunch of people fooling with your child. No, I mean, I love it. I think that's the best thing about uh, mm -hmm. being a playwright. I mean, I, I just was in Washington with a bunch of novelists, and I've noticed how sort of stiff and pompous novelists tend to get after a while. They all think they're Tolstoy after about two or three <laughs> years of writing. And, and I think that has a lot to do with spending too much time alone in a room. Uh, I think it's a, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great thing. I mean, it's hard. You, you know, and you have, there's a lot of frustration. Uh, a lot of the best acting talent at this point has migrated to the West Coast and is on television, so it's really hard to get a good cast together in New York. 
uh, these days. And, and, you know, directors will screw up your work and actors will screw up your work and producers certainly will try to. And, and that's all the frustration, but it's, you know, the rewards are, uh, um, of, of that collaboration are tremendous. And, it, and, and it's, uh, I find it much nicer than being alone. But the playwright does have and retains the right to say halt. Mm -hmm. In other words, not a word can be changed right. in that script without your acquiescence. Right. That's why I can't stand writing. I mean, I'm doing a couple of screenplays now, but uh, the, and the operas that I'm working on, too. I mean, in, in any other form, you realize quickly how much uh, power you have as a playwright. I mean, the playwright in, in text-driven narrative theater in this country is still God, and it's fun to be God. I mean, you, you have you know, as much control as you can uh, um, will yourself to exercise. And, and, you know, I think you can't be too much of a control freak because you'll kill the thing. A theater production is not the same as writing a play, and you have to be able to let it go to a certain extent. I'm still working on that. But, uh, but there's a tremendous respect for the written text in theater, and that tradition uh, makes theater immensely appealing to me. What uh, uh, writers had influence on your own writing? Um, in playwriting, uh, Shakespeare, obviously, um, I mean, on everything. Uh, Chekhov, uh, Brecht, uh, Bertolt Brecht, the German playwright, mm -hmm. is a, probably the biggest single influence. Um, a lot of different poets, um, Walt Whitman and Dickinson and Emerson and uh, Do you have to be careful poets? when uh, uh, you are reading one of those writers whose works you love not to become subconsciously imitative of that writer? Well, you do to a certain extent. I mean, I think that, you know, it's this Harold Bloom thesis that all writing is about overcoming your influences. I mean, you all, every writer starts out imitating. In fact, when you teach writing, one of the things that's the best thing to do is to say, you know, here's a Wallace Stevens poem, imitate it. Uh, and you're going to steal things, uh, no matter how, you know. Tony, uh, you come home to Lake Charles, you told me, mm -hmm. rather frequently. What do you like to do when you go there? Visit the folks? Yeah, well, I mean, primarily it's about visiting my father, mm -hmm. um, who, since my mother's death, has remarried to a wonderful woman, um, and we... Miss the food at all? Um, you know, I, I became a vegetarian. I see. I lost about 100 pounds about th three years ago. Really? Yeah, um, and, and did that by becoming a vegetarian and not eating anything with oil in it. So that kills... Um, Louisiana cooking almost entirely. Completely. And I miss it terribly. Tony, I want to thank you. Uh, you have a play uh, in, uh, uh, I think, previews begin yeah. this very evening at the Public Theater. Right. And you've been most generous with your time, and uh, Louisiana is proud of you. You know, we had one year the Pulitzer Prize, the year you won the Pulitzer, we won it for the novel and poetry. And playwriting. Did you know that? Yeah. All Louisianians. And the, and the novel. I think actually, yeah. And the oh, novel. Yeah. And, and Bob Butler, who won it for the novel, is And the Lake play Charles. was from uh, uh, right, right, Robert Olin Butler. And the playwright is a black man from Bogalusa, Louisiana. Poetry. But, you know, that was the next year. It was? Yeah. Pretty uh, good, though, for the deepest yes. of the deep southern states. Yeah, Thank nice. you so very much for your sure. kindness and hospitality. It's nice to meet you. Thank you, sir. Louisiana Legends is made possible by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Louisiana. This important program series enables us to discover, through the accomplishments of our fellow Louisianians, the unique character of a state so proudly served by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Louisiana for 60 years. For a copy of this program, call 1-800-973-7246 or send 1995 to Louisiana Legends, care of LPB. 7733 Perkins Road, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, 70810. Please allow four to six weeks for delivery.